and I was muted. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's event, the Celebrating Louis Real Day, Métis Realities. We appreciate you making the time to join us today for this event. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Tasha Cloutier. Uh, I was born Tasha Paul, and I am a Lustig Way woman from the Woodstock First Nation in New Brunswick. I am also the Director of Strategic Management and Regional Affairs at Canadian Heritage uh, and a part-time faculty member here uh, with the school. Uh, it's my pleasure to moderate today's session, uh, standing in for my lovely colleague, Shauna. Before we begin, uh, I would like to take the time to acknowledge that I'm calling in today from the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. As someone who has lived here for many years, I have been very fortunate to be hosted on this land uh, and many, many uh, Algonquin people have blessed me with their knowledge, love and grace uh, all this time. Uh, I recognize that we are all calling in and work uh, in different places across the country. So uh, you may work in a territory that's different. I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on that and why it's important to you. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to share some administrative details to help support your experience at this event. Uh, to optimize your viewing experience, we recommend that you disconnect from your VPN uh, and use a personal device to watch the session if you can. Please note, we will have simultaneous interpretation uh, available for this event, as well as CART services, which is closed captioning. Please refer to the reminder email that the school sent to you to access these features. Uh, today, we'll be taking questions through the collaborative video interface. Please go to the top right-hand corner of your screen and click the participate button and enter your question along with your email. We may not get to all of the questions, but we will answer as many as we can. Now, I would like to introduce Marie-Louise Perron, a knowledge keeper, St. Paul University, who will provide traditional opening remarks to open our event. Over to you, Marie-Louise. Marie-Louise de Chinicache en Saskatchewan au tout temps. Ni papa, Gérard Perron, ni maman, Virginie Schnei, Mouchem, Pierre Perron, Cocom, Céline, La Déroute, Famille, Perron, La Déroute, Marion, saint arnaud La Roque. Bonjour tout le monde. J'ai un juste de vous dire bonjour et de décliner uh, ma généalogie, ma parenté, les familles. Vous avez reconnu les les noms, tous, les noms francophones. Aujourd'hui, c'est une belle journée. Le Créateur nous a donné une superbe journée ensoleillée. Peu importe ce qui est arrivé hier, peu importe ce qui arrivera demain, C'est une journée flambe en œuvre pour, pour nous d'en faire à notre gré et en espérant que nous choisirons de faire quelque chose pour faire du bien dans le monde. Étant donné la situation qui sévit ici à Ottawa, C'est le temps, je crois, de se rappeler que nous sommes tous parents. Et quand je dis que nous sommes tous parents, nous sommes parents avec tous les êtres de la Terre. Tous les êtres qui sont de toute nature, que ce soit nous, les deux pattes, les quatre pattes, les animaux, Ceux qui ont les racines dans la terre, ceux qui ont des ailes, ceux comme les poissons qui vivent dans l'eau. Et tous les êtres, visibles et invisibles, d'ailleurs. Alors, nous allons parler des réalités métisses. Et pour ça, Je rappelle, étant donné la raison pourquoi nous sommes ici rassemblés, 
pour un grand secrétaire, pour le soleil qui a été donné, pour nous réchauffer et nous donner la clarté. À notre grand-mère, la lune, qui régit les eaux. Des eaux de la terre, des eaux dans les corps des femmes et de tout le monde. Nous rendons grâce au Créateur. Nous rendons grâce, comme je vous ai dit, pour tous les animaux, parce que ceux-là se sont engagés devant le Créateur pour prendre soin de nous, pour qu'on ait de la nourriture, des vêtements, des abris, des médecines. Donc, ils se sont engagés devant le Créateur pour se sacrifier jusqu'à ce point-là pour nous aider à survivre et croître. Donc, je rends grâce au Créateur et à tous ceux et celles qui sont avec nous aujourd'hui, nos ancêtres qui sont disparus, ils sont ici. Nous les portons dans notre cœur et dans notre ADN. Donc, ils sont ici avec nous. Nous leur demandons de nous donner la parole, notre vérité, juste et bien. Et pour toutes ces raisons, je rends grâce à tous et à toutes. Et je dis, merci, miigwitch, 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 merci, miigwitch. Thank you very much, Marie Louise. That was beautiful. Um, allow me now uh, to welcome the three panelists for today, who will share a specific, a specific perspective on Métis realities. The Honorable Tony Belcourt, Métis leader and advocate who will share his lived experiences and cover perspectives as an elder. Then Mary Louise Perron, Knowledge Keeper, St. Paul University, who will cover the perspective for women. And finally, Gabrielle Fayan, co-CEO and co-founder of the Assembly of Seven Generations, who will cover the perspectives of the youth. Uh, but before turning the floor over to Elder Belcourt, allow me to tell you a bit about his background. I will do the same for each panelist before it's their turn to speak. Born in the historic Métis community of Lac Saint Anne, Alberta, Tony Belcourt's career spans over 50 years of experience and significant achievement in Indigenous affairs, the corporate, government, and not-for-profit sectors. As founding president of the Native Council of Canada, he was instrumental in creating a national voice for Canada's Métis and non-status Indians. And his efforts were an important contributing factor in the Métis being recognized in the Constitution Act of 1982 as one of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. Tony is a well-respected negotiator and as founding president of the Métis Nation of Ontario, he helped to achieve recognition of existing Métis constitutional rights in the 2003 Supreme Court decision, R versus Powley. He was a member of the various board of governors and participated in numerous international conferences, including the negotiations for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Now widely regarded as a Métis elder, he received multiple awards, uh, such as the National Aboriginal Achievement Award for Public Service in 2006, and was appointed as an Officer of the Order of Canada in 2013. Mr. Belcourt, over to you. Thank you, Tasha, and uh, thank you, Marie-Louise, for uh, your wonderful opening. Uh, I don't know that I'm giving a perspective as an elder, I'm giving my perspective. Uh, and uh, what's it like to be Métis in Canada today? Uh, I can tell you it's a heck of a lot different than it used to be uh, when I was growing up, and Marie-Louise would know. Uh, 
uh, well, Gabrielle, you would know too. You would have certainly come up uh, at, at that time, or not my time, but a little later. Uh, when I first came to Ottawa in 1971 to head up the Native Council of Canada, uh, my biggest challenge was to uh, create an awareness about the Métis people, because I think the particularly in Ontario, the, the notion was that Riel uh, uh, was long gone and so were the Métis. And I became a member of the National Press Club and I remember uh, being up there and always people asking me about the Métis people and gosh, didn't know you were still alive and that sort of thing and uh, offending questions like, what's a Métis? Uh, and it was pretty discouraging. But throughout that uh, the first 10 year growth of the, of our, of the Native Council of Canada, uh, we had uh, been able to successfully deal with the federal government on a whole range of issues uh, to get recognized as one of the groups that should receive the federal funding that was being set aside for uh, uh, participatory democracy, it was called at the time. And then 10 years later, my one, one of my successors, Harry Daniels, uh, was president. And he insisted that the word Métis be added to the new Patriot Constitution, to Section 35, uh, which uh, states that existing Aboriginal treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples are hereby recognized and affirmed. Harry insisted that there be a subclause specifying that there, that the words, the Aboriginal peoples uh, are the Indians, Inuit, and Native peoples. Uh, he knew full well that uh, because of how we've been deal dealt with before by the federal government, if that wasn't in the constitution, they would always say, well, um, that own constitutional section only applies to the Indians in the Inuit because we have an Indian Act and because of the Supreme Court decision in uh, 1936, uh, we have to deal with the Inuit. Uh, you're, never, you're still continue to be, um, fall under the jurisdiction of the provinces, go see them for whatever you need. So we were sec very successful. There's an interesting story about how that came about. Uh, later on in in 1993, one of our people in Ontario was uh, charged with illegal hunting and moose, and he decided he was going to fight it. And the new group that we started at the time, Métis National, Métis National Ontario, decided we were going to get behind uh, Steve Powley and his son Roddy. And in 10 years later, in 2003, uh, we had a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court of Canada that uh, Métis rights were never extinguished. Uh, they were never extinguished by treaty with the exception of the treaty that was negotiated in Manitoba in, uh, 19, in uh, 1870. Uh, that uh, because the Métis rights had not been extinguished, they were still existing rights. Uh, that was an amazing uh, breakthrough for us because that meant the federal government could no longer um, uh, say, well, uh, your rights may have existed at one time, which is one of the arguments they made in the court, but I mean, they, they've disappeared or you never had them in the first place. Um, or they've been extinguished somehow. They don't exist. Well, they, the Supreme Court made it very clear. In fact, at every level of court, we had one uh, resounding uh, resounding uh, decision to that effect. So since then, uh, it's been slow to happen, but uh, Métis people are not as harassed as much as they were before about you exercising their constitutional right to hunt and fish for food. Um, the federal government in the last uh, number of years, a uh, few years, uh, has entered into uh, recognition and self-government agreements with the provincial Métis organizations 
from Ontario to Alberta. Um, and because of the Supreme Court decision in the Manitoba land claims case, there are now negotiations going on there uh, with the Métis people that were part of what happened uh, at Red River in, uh, in 1870. Uh, Riel's uh, history, history and contribution to Canada, uh, unfortunately, is, is not well known or, or understood. Uh, it's, it's not taught in schools, which is a uh, tragic as far as I'm concerned, because this is such an incredible uh, part of the history. The turn of events that took place at that time shaped Canada. Um, in 1869, Canada had made a deal with the Hudson's Bay Company to buy the land that <laughs> somehow it had been given uh, in, uh, in England to the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, and that transfer was to take place on January the 1st, 1870. But that fall, Sir Johnny MacDonald was so anxious uh, to make way for the settlers who wanted to come from Ontario, uh, he uh, sent out uh, surveyors and the people there uh, were alarmed because they lived there and followed the traditional um, uh, river lot system of uh, land occupation. So everybody had access to water and, and for their pastures and so on. When these labor surveyors were coming and doing a good thing, they didn't understand what was going on and our people for the most part, did not speak English. But Riel did, because he had gone to uh, uh, law school in Montreal, uh, graduated as a lawyer. Uh, and he stood on the surveyor's chain and he said, you go no further. Uh, that caused an uproar in Ottawa, no doubt. Uh, and Sudani was incensed. But the British Parliament said, because of the Royal Proclamation in 1763, uh, you are required to negotiate with the Métis. Um, because that proclamation stated that none of the British subjects could enter the territory of Indigenous peoples in their uh, colonies uh, without the consent an, an agreement uh, with the Indigenous peoples involved. Well, there had been no such negotiation with any of the Indigenous peoples on the prairies, Métis or First Nations. Uh, and so uh, all of that territory of northern, actually it was northern Quebec and northern Ontario were affected as well, because that was called Rupert's Land, all of the territory, uh, all of the waters, waterways draining into the Hudson's Bay and James Bay uh, were called Rupert's Land. That territory was not part of Canada in any way. Um, in Northern Ontario, that territory ended at the French River, south of Sudbury. Uh, and so that had to, there had to be a negotiation. Riel's people, Riel and his people, established a provisional government and uh, in, uh, in the fall. And they set out uh, terms for negotiation with the government. They had, uh, uh, they laid down what they considered to be the terms. And part of it included that the lands that the people uh, occupied in Red River uh, were going to be uh, recognized as Métis lands. And in addition, there was going to be another 1.4 million acres of land within that little territory at the time, because we're talking about Red River, basically just south of Lake Winnipeg and, and uh, down to the Canadian border from the Ontario border over to around Brandon. That, that was it. And within that territory, an additional 1.4 million acres of lands was to be set aside uh, for the, what was called the children of the half-breeds. Uh, <laughs> why there was a court case is because it was a huge swindle and the people never got their lands. Uh, and a lot of the lands that the people occupied uh, were uh, just run 
when people were run roughshod when the settlers finally came. So, um, uh, as a part of the, those negotiations, also, uh, the people there who were majority French speaking, uh, well, in addition to indigenous languages, of course, including the Métis language, uh, they, uh, uh, they wanted to ensure that the rights of the English minority were going to be respected. So they insisted that, first of all, there'd be a province, there'd be a legislature, that there'd be jurisdiction uh, over judicial matters at, at, the, at provincial levels, that it be a province uh, and have senators and members of parliament and so on. Uh, but also that all of the uh, 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 legal matters uh, in Manitoba were to be in both official languages, the courts, uh, the legislature, and so on. Manitoba, to its great chagrin, in, uh, uh, what, about 20 years ago, Marie-Louise, I think, uh, something like that, uh, found out that uh, they had not been living up to their constitutional obligations, and so all the all the laws and legislation, so it had to be translated into French um, or into English. Uh, no, into French, because everything was going on in English. They just completely uh, disputed or disagreed or ignored, rather, the, uh, the responsibilities. Uh, Riel and many people left. Riel had to leave because it was a bounty on his head of uh, 5,000 dollars, which we equated to uh, many, a few hundred thousand dollars in about 20 years ago in Canadian money. That was all paid out. So he fled to the United States. Uh, he eventually became a U.S. citizen and was a teacher out in Manitoba. When the people in Saskatchewan were being inundated again with settlers and their lands were being uh, uh, impinged upon by, by settlers who didn't care about the fact that they were there. They went to get Riel and bring him back to lead. And we know now that uh, the history now says that uh, he was hanged for treason, high treason, which is a, a, a case no other Canadian has ever been uh, uh, charged with, a charge that no other Canadian ever was charged with. Um, and he was a U.S. citizen, so that whole question about whether or not he could even be charged was uh, is in dispute, but it didn't matter. They didn't hold the trial in Winnipeg or a place where there was a, a judge and, and a jury. They held it out in Manitoba with a magistrate or in Saskatchewan with a magistrate and, uh, and six uh, uh, people instead of a jury. Uh, Riel was hanged, but it was a, an incredible legacy uh, that he left for the Métis people. And another thing was for the First Nations, because one of the terms of entry was that Riel and the provincial government, the people at Red River, considered this to be a Métis treaty. They considered this their treaty. And they specified that once uh, the agreement had been enter, entered into with Canada, then they would be obliged to enter into treaties with all of the First Nations. And as a result, all of that territory in Rupert's land then became negotiated, not all of it, but most of it, uh, into what we call now the number of treaties from 1 to 11. There's other areas, as we well know, that were not covered uh, and people are still involved in, in treaty negotiations in the Northwest Territories uh, and in uh, British Columbia and in Ontario too uh, with the uh, Anishinaabe people. So that's just, a, I guess, a little bit of a history lesson uh, to say that, that being Métis in Canada today for me uh, is profoundly different than when I was growing up. But on the other hand, I feel sorry for Métis, younger Métis people who don't have uh, this knowledge being taught. 
there's still a lot of discrimination everywhere. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's only recently that people have started to feel free uh, to be proud and to express their pride in being Métis. Uh, so I want to thank you very much for uh, inviting me to participate today. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me uh, to, uh, to take part in, in panels like this, uh, especially with uh, these two uh, wonderful uh, people, Gabrielle and Mary Louise. And I want to thank you very much, Tasha. Oh, thank you very much, Tony. That was excellent. Uh, I want to remind those of you who are watching that you can ask questions at any point during uh, during the event by using the raise your hand function. Uh, it'll prompt you to enter your email address uh, in the collaborative video interface and the questions will be sent in. So I'd like to introduce uh, our second panelist now. Um, before turning to uh, Madame Marie-Louise Perron, uh, please note that her presentation today will be in French. And in some cases, participants may wish to switch to the simultaneous interpreted English channel. Uh, simply click settings on the top right-hand corner and select English. Now allow me to tell you a bit about uh, Marie-Louise's background. Uh, Marie-Louise Perron was born on her grandfather's land in Saskatchewan. She is a descendant of Red River Métis and early French newcomers. She holds education and fine arts degrees from the University of Saskatchewan and a master's degree in ethnology from Laval University in Quebec. Through different careers, from high school teacher to visual artist, author, archivist and public servant, she has maintained the storytelling tradition of her people. Now retired, Marie Louise pursues historical and genealogical research, offers workshops on tracing indigenous ancestry, studies traditional violin, and participates in many stories, of many styles of storytelling. She was a member of the Ottawa Organizing Committee for the award-winning Walking With Our Sisters Memorial installation in 2015. Marie Louise has been active for many years in Indigenous community issues, including in roles as counselor and later chair of the Ottawa Region Metis Council, and as a member of the Indigenous Advisory Circle for the Bank of Canada, to name a few. Currently one of St. Paul's University's knowledge keepers, she shares with students in the entire university community her experience and knowledge of Indigenous issues, cultures, worldviews and traditions that she has learned from ancestors and mentors. Madame Perron, à vous la parole. Merci beaucoup, Tasha. Merci aussi à uh, Aleni Belcourt. L'histoire qu'il a racontée, c'est mon... l'histoire. C'est l'histoire de ma famille. Les... Tout ce qui est arrivé, tout ce qu'il lui a raconté est arrivé à mes ancêtres. Mais j'étais déjà adulte quand j'ai su qu'on était métis, parce que je ne le savais pas. J'ai grandi ignorant de tout de ma culture métisse. Aujourd'hui, je porte la ceinture fléchée de mes ancêtres. C'est une ceinture fléchée, une vraie. Elle date du temps de Riel. Et dans le musée à Saint-Boniface, il y a euh, une montre vitrée avec une ceinture fléchée qui ressemble exactement à celle-là. Alors, quand je porte cette ceinture fléchée, je pense toujours à Riel. Et je pense à son histoire. Il a été pendu. On a essayé de lui dire, essayé de dire à la population qu'il était fou et qu'on n'avait pas droit, comme défense, ses avocats, 
on a essayé de le juger, de le faire juger innocent parce qu'il était fou. Et quand Riel a eu vent de ça, il a refusé les services de, son, de ses avocats et il a décidé de se défendre lui-même. Parce qu'il avait tellement de confiance en la justice, il croyait que si il racontait ce qui, ce qui était arrivé, que les gens censés lui donnent la raison, qu'il y avait eu une injustice perpétrée sur les métis et que tout le monde allait comprendre. Malheureusement, c'est pas ça qui est arrivé. Mais je vais juste dire un tout petit mot sur ce qu'on appelle la folie de Riel. Parce que c'est vrai qu'il a eu des périodes de maladie mentale. C'est vrai. Il avait même passé du temps dans un asile à Québec. Quand j'habitais Québec, je reviendrai sur ce sujet-là tantôt, l'asile où Louis Riel avait été interné était juste quelques coins de rue de chez moi, d'où j'habitais. Mais tout ça là, tout ça là, je ne le savais pas. Je ne le savais même pas. C'était extraordinaire. Comment est-ce qu'on peut cacher quelque chose d'aussi énorme à, à plusieurs générations, à plusieurs générations? Parce que quand je l'ai su, j'ai dit, comment ça se fait? Comment est-ce qu'on aurait pu faire ça? D'avoir été associé à un traître, à un malade mental. Comment est-ce que mon arrière-grand-père, comment et pourquoi mon arrière-grand-père s'est associé à Riel en 1869-70 dans le combat, dans la résistance du Canada à la rivière rouge? Comment est-ce qu'on aurait pu oublier ça? Ou est-ce que c'était un oubli? Ou est-ce que c'était une clandestinité? Est-ce que ma famille a adopté la clandestinité comme moyen de s'assimiler à la population environnante, d'abord en français puis ensuite en anglais, ou bien est-ce que c'était juste pour survivre? Et comment cette clandestinité s'est vécue? Notre parler français Pourtant, n'était pas comme le parler français de nos, de la famille de ma mère, par exemple, qui n'est pas métisse. Les gens nous disaient, votre parler est donc bien drôle. S'ils ne disaient pas, vous parlez mal. Mais je ne savais pas que notre parler, c'était le français métif. Et juste pour vous dire une anecdote, il y a quelques semaines, juste il y a quelques semaines, j'ai commencé des cours de Métif, de la langue Métif. Et c'est ainsi que j'ai pu vous saluer dans la langue Métif pour la première fois dans une assistance. Pas canadienne, pas canadienne. Donc, je suis un tout petit bébé dans le réapprentissage de ma propre langue. Mais c'est quelque chose que la technologie, aujourd'hui, qui nous cause tellement de problèmes ailleurs dans la société, 
Ah, aussi, c'est bon côté parce que ça me permet de réapprendre ma langue, qui je suis dans ma propre langue. À mon âge, à mon âge, <rire> Alors, alors, comment la clandestinité est-elle vécue chez nous? Il y avait des sujets tabous. Les gens s'autocorrigeaient. Les gens ne faisaient pas référence à leur... les éléments culturels qui auraient pu les identifier comme étant autochtones. Et tout ça a continué jusqu'en 1980. J'étais à Québec en train de faire ma thèse de maîtrise en ethnologie et mon sujet, c'était les chansons traditionnelles, les chansons traditionnelles françaises. Je voulais savoir, les chansons traditionnelles françaises, je voulais connaître le trajet qu'elles avaient pris de la France par mes ancêtres français au Québec, ensuite sur le parcours canadien. Et là, je suis tombée sur les voyageurs qui ont transporté toutes ces chansons à travers le pays. Pas juste, pas juste en Saskatchewan, mais partout, partout au pays. Et drôlement, ce sont aussi les chansons qui m'ont mené à mon vrai chez moi, chez mes ancêtres métis. Je vous ai dit, tout ça a changé en 1980. C'est parce qu'en 1980, mon père est décédé. Et comme par hasard, j'étais en Saskatchewan en train de faire du terrain pour ma tête sur des chansons. Alors, avec tout le, tout le tracas des funérailles et tout ça, j'ai mis de côté mon travail, mes interviews sur ma thèse. J'ai mis de côté aussi la pensée que là, il faudrait que, que, que je reprenne le travail. Mais là, c'était le temps de rendre visite et avoir des conversations, des conversations avec ma parenté. Et dans les conversations avec ma parenté, le, la loi du silence était levée complètement. Les gens ont commencé à parler. Et quand je les, je les ai interviewés pour ma thèse, ils ont raconté des histoires, chanté des chansons, des contes, des légendes, parfois de la, de la source française, mais autrefois la source parfaitement autochtone. Comment le renard est devenu roux. Pourquoi les perdrix sont achetés aujourd'hui? Pourquoi le vautour n'a pas de plumes sur la tête? Tout ça, ce sont des contes animaliers autochtones. Je ne connaissais pas non plus l'histoire que Tony vient de raconter. Je ne la connaissais pas. Jusqu'à temps, une cousine de mon père me dise que notre arrière-grand-père, son grand-père, avait participé aux événements à la rivière rouge. Participé aux côtés de Riel. Aux côtés de Riel. Puis elle me dit, je devrais le savoir, parce qu'il a laissé un récit de ce qui s'est passé. Elle est partie dans, dans une autre pièce, elle habitait à une maison de retraité à l'époque. Elle est partie dans une autre pièce, puis elle est revenue avec un récit, 
ce que mon arrière-grand-père appelait une mémoire des événements de 1869-70, auxquels lui avait participé. Qui était là? Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé? À quelle date? Qui a fait quoi? Demandez non. Et des points de vue sur les événements qui n'étaient pas le point de vue officiel que moi j'avais appris à l'école. Et ça, cette ignorance a même perduré pendant que j'étais à l'université. Parce que l'histoire officielle de ce qui s'est passé au Manitoba était l'histoire des rebelles qui avaient essayé de briser le pays. Pas juste une fois, mais deux fois. Mon arrière-grand-père est resté au Manitoba après 1869-70 avec ses douze enfants. Il a vécu la terreur qui est arrivée après 1885, après 1869-70 aussi, quand les, les gens étaient insultés dans les rues, étaient battus, certains étaient mis à mort. Et en 1885, il est parti de l'autre côté des lignes, comme on disait à l'époque, aux États-Unis, avec ses douze enfants. Et là, je me dis, ah là là, là, ça veut dire que moi, je fais partie des, des rebelles, des terroristes, donc, on a pendu le leader, ce malade mental qui a essayé de briser le pays, pas juste une fois, mais deux fois. Et ça, ça mettait mon grand-père dans ce groupe-là, qui était associé à ces gens-là. Quand j'ai su que mon arrière-grand-père avait participé aux événements 1869-70, et quand j'ai lu son point de vue, qu'il s'était associé à des gens qui résistaient les actions d'un gouvernement qui n'avait pas de légitimité dans cette partie du pays, là, mon esprit rebelle a dit Voilà qui je suis. Je suis. Je fais partie de ce monde-là. Je fais partie de ces, ces rebelles-là. Parce que j'étais toujours en train de me battre pour garder ma langue française à l'époque. Je me rappelle le jour même où j'ai décidé que ma langue française était à moi, et puis qu'il n'y avait pas un chat qui allait me l'enlever. Et je l'ai gardé, et ça m'a toujours servi. Quand j'étais dans une partie du pays où on parlait anglais, j'avais du travail parce que je parlais français. Quand j'étais dans une partie du pays où on parlait français, j'avais du travail parce que je parlais anglais. Ça m'a toujours bien servi. Une fois que les conversations avec les membres de la famille, les histoires, les contes, tout ça là, j'ai commencé à regarder mes propres souvenirs de mon enfance pour voir s'il y avait des indices là, s'il y avait eu des indices là, qu'on aurait pu être métis. Et là, j'ai trouvé des mots qui n'étaient pas des mots français. Des... L'accent qu'on avait dans notre français, ce n'était pas l'accent français de, du Québec. Et quand j'ai trouvé les documents, parce que j'ai hérité des documents de la famille, ça m'a dit, voilà qui je suis. Alors j'ai tout de suite, suite dit à mes frères et sœurs, « Hey, vous autres là, 
on est des métis, on a une histoire extraordinaire qui a, qui a fait partie de l'histoire du Canada. Nos peuples, notre peuple métis, a, a créé une partie de l'histoire du Canada et mes frères et sœurs ont dit, on ne parle pas de ça. Hein? On ne parle pas de ça, donc il voulait que la, le silence continue. Alors, je, ai, je les ai eus par la ruse, parce que j'avais hérité des documents familiales, y compris des lettres qu'ils avaient écrites qu'ils avaient écrites par enfants à leurs grands-parents et euh, les membres de la famille. Je racontais une partie de l'histoire du Canada, l'histoire de notre famille avec. Et finalement, en 2005, j'ai participé à un projet de vidéo où j'ai raconté l'histoire de mon arrière-grand-père. Et j'ai posé la question à mes frères et sœurs, je compte faire ce projet-là, qu'en dites-vous? Et tout le monde a dit, vas-y, sauf une qui n'a rien dit. Ben, j'ai dit, c'est sur sept. J'y vais. Je fonce. Et c'est ce que j'ai fait. Quand la vidéo est sortie, celle qui n'avait pas répondu m'a écrit une lettre pour me dire « t'avais juste à ouvrir ta grande gueule. Maintenant, les gens vont passer chez moi et vont brûler ma maison. » En 2005, elle avait toujours, il y avait des gens, des métisses qui avaient toujours peur que les membres de leur communauté brûlent leur maison parce qu'ils étaient métisses. Et ça, c'était en 2005. Et là, comme on y a raconté, nous avons... Uh, obstiné comme on peut l'être, comme métis, on a gardé foi de notre, de notre histoire, de notre rôle dans le Canada. Et aujourd'hui, on raconte notre histoire fièrement parce qu'on sait que même handicapé, d'une maladie mentale de temps à autre, Riel a pu faire des choses extraordinaires. Absolument extraordinaires. Aujourd'hui, on reconnaît que la maladie mentale, ce n'est pas une description de la personne. C'est une maladie. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on peut Qu'est-ce qu'on peut accomplir? Mais qu'est-ce qu'on peut accomplir? Cet homme-là, il a aidé à bâtir le Canada. Et un Canada qui est censé reconnaître une place au métis dans la fondation du Canada. Alors, pour rien, c'est un héros pour les métis, c'est un héros pour moi. Et c'est pour ça que je suis ici aujourd'hui pour vous en parler. De parler de qui il était pour moi, de qui il était pour notre famille. Et pour parler de toutes nos relations aussi et de rappeler aux gens que nous sommes tous reliés. Nous sommes comme les deux faces d'une de, médaille. Impossible de scinder en deux. Parce que nous sommes parentés, nous sommes, nous sommes tous reliés par des liens de parenté avec la Terre et avec les uns les autres. Commençons à agir 
comme des gens qui sont parents, à se croire, à croire au, à l'histoire, à croire à notre parenté et aider et s'entraider les uns des autres. Parce que la Terre en a besoin aujourd'hui. Et nous aussi, on en a besoin. Des fois, même aujourd'hui, je rencontre des gens qui disent « Ah, ton père a choisi pour toi. Va maintenant faire ton lit avec ceux qu'il a choisi. Mais il y en a d'autres, Métis et Premières Nations, qui me disent « Il y a tant. » Faisons un bout de chemin ensemble sur cette terre merveilleuse à qui nous nous appartenons tous. Et à cela, je reprends courage. Et je fais le prochain bout de chemin qui s'ouvre devant moi. Merci de votre écoute. Thank you very much, Mary Louise. That was, was amazing. Uh, the next uh, panelist that will be speaking will be Gabrielle Fayon. So uh, give me a moment to introduce her to you. Uh, Gabrielle is an off-settlement Métis woman whose family is from Fishing Lake Métis Settlement in Alberta. Gabrielle is an award-winning woman for her work in community, youth empowerment, and Indigenous rights awareness. She's worked with several Indigenous and non-profit organizations and is currently a helper and co-founder of the Assembly of Seven Generations, A7G. A7G is an Indigenous owned and youth led nonprofit organization focused on cultural support and empowerment programs and policies for Indigenous youth while being led by traditional knowledge and elder guidance. Gabrielle is passionate about cultural resurgence and justice for all Indigenous peoples. Over to you, Gabrielle. Cool. Um, so, Tanse Gabriel Victoria Feyant Nitpagarson, Papjahanse Otsenia, Ani Dojo, Mishen Dengue, Anquat Kwendish Nakaz, Papjahanse Ndon Juba, Umamale Nene Nishnabe King Ndon G, Makwando Dam, Nisame Dana Ashe, Nisle Ndeso Babonwe, um, Chief and Dow, Otipa Masawak and Dow, um, A7G and Dono Key. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, my name is Gabrielle Victoria Fayant. Most people know me as Gabby. Um, and I was, I was really like brainstorming how I was going to present this and talk about my reality as an indig as a Metis person. So I'm not sure where I'm going to start off, but here we go. <laughs> um, so just to give you like a little bit of background, I do come from, my family comes from Fishing Lake Métis Settlement. Um, my dad and my aunties, lots of my cousins and uncles um, still live in Fishing Lake to this day. Uh, Fayant is a pretty popular name in Fishing Lake, um, also related to the Perontos. Um, Tate and uh, all kinds of folks um, with those lineage. Um, my family originally started out um, in, in Ontario and Quebec in the late 1700s um, and we moved. We kept on moving um, right up until the 1900s. We kept going west and further west and west. Um, we fought in the Red River Resistance um, we were care carekeepers for the horses. Um, we've been taking care of the horses for several generations now. Um, and Gabriel Dumont uh, actually uh, wrote our family a letter to ask us to take care of the horses during the resistance. We then also uh, lived in Batash, um, one of the, the well-known Métis strongholds. Um, if you visit Batash, my family's name is all over, and um, I often go there once a year to put down my tobacco to offer um, 
prayers to my ancestors and um, just like acknowledging all the struggles they, they went through so that I could be here today. Um, later, we were also um, part of the road allowance people. Uh, we lived in severe poverty, um, but despite living in severe poverty, like my my kukums and my chapans, they still like rock their best furs and their best beadwork and their caribou tasting and you know they're most beautiful. They always presented themselves so beautifully. Um, you would never be able to tell that these these folks were living in severe poverty and off of um, you know just hunting uh, and trapping rodents and squirrels and uh, groundhogs and things like that. So um, I come from a, a long line of matriarchs that are very, very proud, very, very proud people. Um, so later in the 1930s in Alberta, um, there was a call for Métis families to come and live on the Métis settlements. At this time, they were actually called half-breed reserves. And so we were still called half-breeds at that time. And so there was a call for families to come and, and live in the settlements that were being created. There was actually 12 at the time, um, but from, from the 1930s until now, uh, some, some went through extreme hardships and there's actually only eight Métis settlements uh, today. Um, Fishing Lake is the one where my family called home. There was already there was already Métis families living there, and so when my family got the call, um, we said, "Yeah, we'll go live there," because because my family at that time had been living in um, just diaspora, just um, just having a really hard time, and. Uh, we went there and the folks that were already living there, they said, you can come live here, but you have to put in work. We're not going to give you anything. We're not going to give you any handouts. You're going to have to build your own homes. You're going to have to to also give back to community. And so giving back to community is something that is instilled in, in me and my family to this day. Um, and so we've been in fishing lake since the 1930s and that's where my, my cookum, uh, who's my namesake, my cookum, Victoria Fayon, um, she was really known as the rock of fishing lake until she passed away. Um, and she said, no problem, we'll put in the work. And um, she was an entrepreneur in all kinds of ways. Um, you know, she had some cows and some chickens and so she, She'd feed the community with milk and eggs, and she was a seamstress. She was a beater. Um, she was also a midwife. And so in her time, um, she probably raised about 30 children, and she brought many children into this world as well, many Métis babies. And um, on the flip side, she was also an undertaker. So as people passed on to the next world, she took care of them as well. Um, and so I in no way live up to my cookum in like those type of ways, but I am really known in Ottawa as someone who does all kinds of things. Um, and really I try to I try to live up to those values and give back to community and yeah, there's the I don't have any babies myself. I don't have any children myself, but uh, I end up being called like a second mom or an auntie to many youth um, in the Ottawa community. So myself in particular, I I don't want to speak for all Métis youth because that's like a huge population of many different experiences. Um, so specifically, I'm off settlement. So my family still lives in Fishing Lake but I didn't grow up in Fishing Lake. But the community and my family obviously still claim me. I'm really, really proud to come from the Métis settlements. It's a really beautiful history, really rich culture and, and beautiful people. And so there is a privilege with being an off-settlement person. Um, as, as things got harder and harder to live on the settlements, 
um, many families left the settlements. Many families left to go live in towns or cities where it would have been easier in, in some ways. There's still a lot of racism and discrimination that exists, which always makes it hard to be an indigenous person. But there was there was some ease in, in moving to the cities. Um, and, and some Métis passed as white. Some Métis had that privilege of being white looking or white presenting. Um, but for the families that stayed on the Métis settlements, uh, they really held the land. They took care of the land and they had to struggle so much to make, make sure that there's land for me, for me to go back to eventually. Um, and so I really, really have so much love for all those folks that, that stayed in, in the settlements and protected the land. Those are like the land defenders and um, they're my land defenders for, for my generation and the future generations. Um, so living off settlement um, and being a Métis person uh, with that, that history and that family connection, um, it was not easy. It was not easy being a Métis person. That's my reality. It was so challenging. Um, I grew up in severe poverty as well. Um, so those cycles of systemic racism never ended. They just carried on. Um, and I, I lived in the north end of Edmonton um, until I was about 13. And uh, then we eventually came to Ottawa. And uh, in Ottawa, um, I still experienced many of the same, the same realities, living in severe poverty, um, to the point where my mom used to panhandle. Um, you know, we had tabs at the corner store because we didn't have enough money to buy a box of craft dinner. That's how rough it was. Um, there was also a lot of intergenerational trauma um, intergenerational trauma that came from generations of just experiencing horrible situations. Um, just the trauma alone from having to run from the RCMP that considered us to be terrorists. That's trauma that was never really healed. And then that trauma carried on into residential schools and day schools and convents. And, and then the 60s group. Um, which also affected the Métis settlements very, very severely. Um, I was carrying on with, I was living with a lot of trauma. And so trauma then turns into uh, mental health issues. Um, it turns into depression and PTSD, anxiety, suicidal ideations. It turns into alcohol and drug abuse. Um, and that, that's what I was living with. Uh, that's what I was struggling with as a teenager in Ottawa. Um, I didn't really understand why. I just thought that this is how my family is. This is what our family's like. I didn't realize that, I didn't realize our history. And like Tony mentioned, no one ever taught me about Louis Riel. You know, I just was living with this lived experience as a Métis person. Um, I dropped out of high school. Like all the statistics you can think about, like that was me and that's what I was living through. Um, there were several times where, where I would have been missing or could have been murdered. Um, as a Métis woman, it, the, the crisis of MMIW is very, very close to me. Um, I, had a, I have a half-sister that was murdered, and I have an auntie that was murdered. I also grew up with a lot of Indigenous folks. Uh, in Ottawa, there's a lot of First Nation and Inuit folks as well. And I've had friends that have gone missing. Um, and so it's it's really challenging being a Métis person. Even to this day, um, I still feel scared to, to go out by myself. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that, you know, I, in certain situations, I can pass as white. And that gives me a privilege. That gives me, um, it gives me a privilege in this, this society today. Um, but 
growing up, I really was never accepted by by white peers. I was always told I was like a little bit different. I was too poor. I had a weird accent. <laughs> um, and people are always wondering where I came from. And I was like, my family has been living here for thousands of years. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it was a really interesting time. I think uh, later on in life, um, probably when I was about 23 or so, um, I, uh, I began to learn about residential schools. I actually did an internship at the uh, Aboriginal Healing Foundation. And I remember reading this really thick book about the realities of Métis people. And in that book, they talked about the settlements and they talked about the impacts of intergenerational trauma. And I was like, wow, they're talking about me. And I finally went back to my aunties and my some of my uncles and I asked them about it. At first, they didn't really want to talk about it. Uh, they, they said, oh, you know, that's just how it was. Um, but that, that shouldn't have been how it was. The treatment that Métis folks went through over the last 200 years is inexcusable. It's unacceptable and it, 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 it shouldn't be normalized. And so finally, you know, years after bringing up those conversations, a lot of more folks in my family are being more open. And they're talking about their experiences and they're they're finally healing and saying that no that's not right um and there is a lot of trauma that we have to get through and so now more and more of my family is moving back to fishing lake and um it's it's really nice to see to go home to fishing lake and see my godmother that lives there and my cousins and my aunties and you know, I go back and we hear those songs and um, there's there's still jigging. Fishing Lake is known as a community with <laughs> some really good jiggers. But on the flip side, Fishing Lake is also um, a community that lost a lot of our hunters. So that's the really cool thing about the settlements is that there's the way that we explain the eight communities and the eight settlements is that it's kind of like a, a federation of different communities and each community has its own strengths and even cultures in a way, and even different languages because some of the Northern communities um, have like a Dene influence. So um, we're not all the same. And I really, I really get frustrated with that idea that all Métis people are the same. Like, as you even listen to me and Tony and Mary and Louise, we're very different. You know, we all have different experiences. Um, and I think that while we have a lot in common and our, our shared history is, is what connects us, we have to acknowledge that we're also different in some ways and that our family stories deserve to be heard, all of our family stories. Um, so that's like, I don't even know if that's what I planned on saying, but that's <laughs> what came out. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really I have a lot of pride in being Métis. Um, just from the settlements though, you know, in the last census, there was over 500,000 folks that identified, that self-identified as being Métis. Um, but the Métis settlements are actually less than 5,000 people. So within the larger conversation of, of Métis identity and culture, I find that the settlements often get uh, ignored. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, folks from the settlements, you know, we don't, we don't have like a really high university graduation rate. A lot of folks that had to, that left the settlements um, and grew up around privilege, they often have that university. But there's a a bit of a, a gap that happens or like a bit of a tension that happens because um, folks that have like lived on the settlement and, and protected that land, they might not talk as, as like, like professional or with that academic language. Um, but they still have so much knowledge and, and understanding of the land. 
And then what happens is folks that have gone through university and that formal training have a different way of speaking almost. Um, and so there's a bit of a tension that happens. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, to acknowledge that, that just because someone doesn't know their history as a Métis person or has like a really strong Métis accent <laughs> or um, any of those kind of things doesn't mean that they deserve to be treated less than. And going through formal, formal education and university gives you so much privilege. Um, and so I just want to encourage folks to, to listen to those voices that don't get listened to enough because there's so much, there's so much knowledge there. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that and just say, uh, um, thanks for listening and thanks for having me. Wow. Uh, thank you very much, Gabrielle, Tony, and Mary Louise. Uh, all of your words really resonated with me. And, uh, and Gabrielle, we don't always get to plan our responses to things. As you know, you think you're going to say one thing and something totally different comes out, but it, it's always the right thing. Uh, so now, I mean, we're getting, we're getting the questions. They're coming in in the background. And uh, I would like to start, uh, go straight into our Q&A period uh, to remind you all um, that you can submit your questions. Uh, so let's see, I remind you, you use your button to submit questions. It's in the upper right hand corner of your screen and you enter your question along with your email address and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Uh, the first question, uh, I think, I think this one would be a great one for Tony, uh, but, uh, Marie Louise and Gabrielle absolutely have an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, question one is could you share the history about why Métis rights were considered to be under the provinces and not recognized at the federal level? Yes, in a, in a nutshell, it goes back to uh, the division of powers between the federal government and the provinces in the old British North America Act, section 91 and 92. 91 dealt with the federal powers to legislate um, and 91 brackets, 24, uh, is Indians and lands reserved for Indians. Uh, provinces under 92 have uh, more uh, legislation for things more close to home, like hospitals and highways and so on. Canada has uh, national defense, finance, all of these other things, federal provincial relations and transfer of money, collection of taxations. So 9124, Indians and lands reserved for Indians. So until 1936, or before that, uh, the federal government took the position, well, well, they started to define who the Indians are. Uh, First Nations people were not part of any of this discussion. It's the federal government that decided, okay, we'll define who an Indian is. Uh, and you have to live on a, uh, well, not necessarily, but, you had to be registered by the quotes chief of membership for Indian affairs at the time. Um, and if you married, if a woman at the time married an Indian, quote unquote Indian, uh, then she gained status or she lost it if uh, she married some a woman, married someone who was not registered as an Indian. So there's that kind of all sorts of divisions that had grown up. The, uh, uh, the Quebec government took the federal government to court in, uh, in the early uh, 1930s to say that the federal government has responsibility for the Inuit as well. They called them the Eskimos. And the case was at the Supreme Court of Canada was called the Re-Eskimos. And they determined that uh, these are indigenous people. The federal government has responsibility for them too. But there was never a case that had gone forward uh, saying that the federal government had any jurisdictional responsibility to legislate for the Métis people. Uh, that was never done. Uh, we came about that in, in getting that uh, uh, designation through the Constitution Act uh, and then the Supreme Court case in, in Paoli. 
So the federal government clearly has legislative authority and responsibility uh, to legislate where, where Métis people are. And that's why now there are negotiations going on with the, uh, with the, within the Métis nation uh, for self-government uh, negotiations and for the provision of programs and services similar to those that are uh, now provided to First Nations and Native women. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Gabrielle and Marie Louise, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I can add um, just a little bit more information about the Metis settlements in particular. Uh, so the Metis Settlements Betterment Act is actually with the Alberta government. Um, and so there's a co-administration with the Alberta government to this day. Um, that's just how you know, the, the Fathers of Federation lobbied the, fe the provincial government um, for the land. And so there's always been a struggle um, with the Métis settlements because, because we have that agreement and I don't know if you could call it an agreement because we have that act with the, the provincial government. The federal government ignored the Métis settlements for decades. Um, and so that's why there's such severe poverty and, and such horrible infrastructure problems on the settlements is because of that complete disregard. There was always that argument, well, oh, you have the, you're actually a provincial responsibility, you know, just like governments do with, with so many things. Um, there's always like this hot potato. No one really wants to be responsible, right? Because it means money. Um, but the Daniels decision was a huge, huge, um, like, victory for all Métis and, and even the Métis settlements um, because it reaffirmed that uh, we were Indigenous people with a federal fiduciary, that the federal government had a fiduciary duty to, which we've always been saying, uh, but it was finally affirmed in the Daniels decision. Um, and, you know, we, we bring up that real proclamation all the time because all Métis are part of that real proclamation. Um, so yeah, just like a little bit, a, like a more distinct thing about the settlements in particular. Thanks for bringing up the Daniels decision. I, uh, I forgot to do that. Uh, good for you, Gabrielle. Awesome. Uh, apparently, uh, within the uh, within the main chat, there's a lot of people saying, you know, Marcy, thank you, Miigwech, for sharing your stories. So there's a lot of gratitude out there and love. I'll share that first. Uh, next, uh, we have a question that I think is really important to this conversation. Um, uh, and uh, I'll, I think you just put your hand up if you want to start. Uh, what resources would you recommend to learn more about Métis history? and to learn about current Métis issues and priorities. What are your recommendations? Um, there's a couple of excellent sources. One of them, I think the best is uh, uh, the uh, Gabrielle Dumont Institute. Uh, uh, they have a huge resource uh, papers and libraries and so on um, to to go to and uh, the uh, Louis Riel Institute in Manitoba is another uh, good source uh, but a great place is also uh, good old library and archives Canada <laughs> thanks Tony Marie Louise uh. Les gens qui me connaissent euh, savent que j'ai travaillé euh, longtemps à Bibliothèque et Archives Canada. People who know me know that I worked for a long time at Library and Archives Canada. And one of the roles that I had there was um, I was in charge of uh, the genealogy and military personnel records section. And also, um, also in charge of creating research tools that made it easier for people to find the information about uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. So we created 
we created uh, workbooks that that explain to people because finding records about uh, Indigenous people at Library and Archives Canada is extremely difficult. Simply, be, well, simply, not simply, <laughs> in a complicated way because of the way that the Department of Indian Affairs evolved over time. The kinds of restrictions that were imposed on, on records. Uh, in some cases, there were records that were hundreds of years old where restrictions were still being imposed. Um, and so therefore, being in the public service sector where I was, um, regardless of the different roles that I played at uh, Library and Archives Canada over many years, it, um, it, was, it was still to, to help people, to help people to, to actually get into those records and also to make the entire place a welcoming place for for researchers i don't know how many indigenous people i have who told me that they walked in the door and they were so intimidated just by walking in the door and seeing the security guards there that they turned around and walked walked out again and this is this is everybody's stuff it's their stuff it's our stuff so therefore Therefore, my role was to, to make it less intimidating and make it more, um, more approachable and to also get the information out into the communities about how, what the Library and Archives uh, workings were, teaching people about how to do genealogy and where they might find information about their, about their ancestors. And of course, indigenous ancestry because of the convolutions of the of the Indian Act. And Tony was mentioning a couple there about um, about women who who married out, married out, as in they uh, they didn't marry uh, in the, uh, First Nations men or or Métis men, uh, and therefore they were kicked out of the kicked out of the their homes uh, on the reserve. They had they, lo they lost everything. They lost all of the rights. And then the government initiated a, a convoluted, convoluted regulations about okay, what about the kids of these people? What about the grandchildren of these people? Well, there are some that fall into this category and some that fall into that category within the same family. So it created huge divisions within families. It's just. It was just horrible. I mean, it, and it, it's, it's not finished yet. We still haven't got to the point where the, um, where the results and the intergenerational trauma of those regulations continue, uh, continue today, especially, especially to women. I mean, women have had to fight for everything that they have achieved. And um, we, from, from the beginning, from the beginning, we were in those canoes. We were in those canoes and if we had to paddle, we paddled. If there were children born on the, on, on the, on the trail, they were born on the trail, they picked up their kids and they continued whatever their role was whether it was in the canoes, whether it was on the trail, whether it was uh, looking after the people on the hunt, whether regardless of what it was. So uh, think twice before you cross Métis women. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Marie-Louise. Oh, sorry, Gabrielle, I was going to ask if you had anything to add. Yeah, I'll just add really quickly. Um, like the first place I would start for the general public is to just visit like the Métis Settlements General Council website. Um, so there's a lot, like be, like as I mentioned, Métis Settlements are a smaller population and the larger Métis population. 
and there's a different lived experience. And so a lot of the larger research, it kind of just overwhelms the smaller voices. So I'd really recommend going to the Métis Settlement General Council uh, website for more specific stuff on Métis settlements. Um, and uh, I also would recommend building relationships with people. Uh, the Métis settlements are so like tight knit that there's a lot of um, like protection over our stories and, and who we are. Um, and so you have to build relationships with folks. <laughs> folks aren't gonna tell you what's going on until like they can trust you. Um, and then lastly, I would just add onto Mary Louise's point. Um, there's a lot of like men in Métis history, like Louis Riel, Gabriel Dumont, even the Métis settlements, the Fathers of Federation. So look at that, but also know that for every one of these men that's like considered a hero, there's like 10 Métis women that supported that, that man and were like, you know, whipping his butt and <laughs> just getting him into shape. And, you know, Métis women are just deadly. Like, I don't know about you, but my aunties, they're the ones who run the show, <laughs> you know, they're the ones keeping track of people, where they're at. <laughs> so that's the other part, important part about being Métis is that when you're Métis, it's not just like a bloodline or lineage, but it's literally people holding you accountable. So you can't just say anything you want or make up things because your family and your aunties in particular they're going to hold you accountable. Um, and so there's a responsibility in identifying as me, T. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I want to, I want to, uh, to come back to the, to the aunties because uh, it was the aunties who were the guardians of the culture. It was the, the aunties who taught me who I was, the aunties and the great aunties. And now in my role, because I have no children, it's my role as an auntie to teach them to my nephews and nieces. And I still teach my brothers and sisters as well, those who want to, those who want to listen to me. Go aunties. <laughs> oh my land, I feel like I'm gonna cry. Um, aunties, aunties, where I come from, great aunties. I lost one of my aunties in November to COVID-19. So um, believe me that I, I know that loss and I don't have any siblings. Uh, so I get to be auntie to people I choose. <laughs> I love that too. So thank you for that. Um, you know, the quality of your presentations and the two Q's and A's we were able to squeak out before we had to move on is absolutely excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so now um, there were some other questions that weren't able to get answered and we'll try to find a way to address them. Uh, but for now, uh, I just want to say thank you, Oliwan, Miigwech, Marcy, thank you uh, for everything that you've done and, and given to us today as, as a group. Uh, and I would like to turn the floor over to uh, Tony to deliver our closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Natasha. Uh, and Marie-Louise and Gabrielle. Uh, and I want to thank the uh, organizers uh, for uh, arranging this. I'm glad it's being taped and, uh, and I hope that we're going to be able to uh, see all the questions later on and uh, we can then try to respond to people that have written in. Uh, the um, the thing that I'd like to say is, is that, you know, we, we have different ways, uh, as Gabrielle was mentioning, we have very different ways uh, within our communities and even individuals. Uh, many of our people follow um, either Catholic or Anglican uh, religion in some some places, but many of our people also follow uh, uh, spiritual traditions that have been passed down by their grandmothers and their aunties. Uh, 
when I look at my history, I, uh, I, I don't say that I'm, I'm a descendant of the men who went out there. I'm a descendant of the women who took the visiting men coming in. Uh, and that's, I'm extremely uh, proud of, of all of that. Um, when we have gatherings, uh, traditionally we want to say to everyone that we are wishing them all a safe journey uh, to go to their homes. Um, well, this is Zoom, so uh, we can't say that kind of thing, but uh, we can wish that everyone will uh, uh, hopefully uh, have come away from this with, with uh, a better understanding of who the Métis people are, uh, that it will help uh, to develop better relations between our peoples, uh, and that uh, we're going to be able to uh, also look into things more and more about the traditional ways of our people in terms of dealing with um, with uh, with healing and and uh, uh, and the way that that we want to uh, acknowledge our ancestors and and to thank them for everything they have done and brought to us and that applies to everyone that you think about your ancestors, where you're from, who they are, be grateful uh, to all of that. And we also, uh, many of us, uh, pray to our ancestors when we want to bring the spirits of them together on uh, important occasions. Uh, we do that and, and say also when they pass, that we want them to go safely on their journey. We want them to transition and go safely, continue on their journey into the, into the new spirit world. So I want to wish everybody a safe journey. I see. Thank you so much, Tony, that was beautiful. Um, I just want to, uh, again, thank you all for being here. Uh, on behalf of the school, uh, again, to extend my thanks to the Honorable Tony Belcourt, Madame Marie-Louise Perron, and Gabrielle Fayon, and all of you across the country for participating in today's discussion. It was, it was beautiful. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Your feedback is also very important to the school, so I encourage you to complete the electronic questionnaire that will come to you in the next few days. Uh, the school has is always, always busy, forever busy, and has several other virtual events to offer. I encourage you to check our website regularly and keep up to date with the latest news, uh, register for upcoming opportunities, and uh, many of which are focusing on Indigenous uh, matters and themes. Uh, for example, there's some virtual events uh, coming up in the next few months. There will be one on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, the Decade of Indigenous Languages, which has been decreed by UNESCO, uh, and the duty to consult and accommodate everyone's favorite. So once again, thank you all and have a great day. Bye.